It is Friday, July 7th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello everyone, welcome back to another omnificent episode of LTPS. We've got more PlayStation news, rumors, and updates to discuss as we normally do, so let's begin with our PS Plus reminder. This is your first call for the July PS Plus Essential Games. They're live on PSN, so go ahead and claim those, get that done and out of the way. And for our first story, let's talk about Final Fantasy XVI's recent patch, patch 1.03, which does address probably the number one complaint I've seen about this game so far outside of the you know, more subjective matters, and that's the motion blur effect. So if this bothers you, if it's nauseating, you can finally adjust the motion blur strength or you can turn it off completely. Um, and you can also adjust and turn off the player follow cameras when you're moving or attacking. And there's also wider sensitivity settings for the camera as well, alongside new controller layouts and um, a few other issues being fixed here as well. So uh, we did see on day one, the game was in a very playable state, even without the day one patch. Uh, but that was really the one straggler that came out when the game shipped was the motion blur. So you can finally mess around with that and uh, set it to your liking. Now, something else we can mention for FF16 is the sales of the game, which has been so far kind of a hot topic issue. Not entirely sure why, it's almost like some want the game to do bad or argue that the game is doing bad, but uh, what we've seen so far from Square the first five days was 3 million shipped and digitally sold, which I would say is good given the PS5 install base, and one other angle of this is how the game is doing and performing in Japan. You know, this certainly is a very Japanese-centric IP historically, you know, goes without saying. So um, that's one part of it as well, where, you know, we can contextualize how well it's doing there based on the first week sales being at 336,000 units. And then it was noted that in week two, it dropped by 90 something percent, which is a pretty big drop off. But you know, most games by week two, they see a dramatic fall off a cliff. Um, but some would argue otherwise that, hey, this is a lot worse than what we normally see. But again, it's all about context. So for Japan, we only have about three, four million PS5s sold there on paper. And I say on paper because Japan does have a bit of a situation going on where um, despite stock finally being okay uh, at retail and there, there's no more lottery systems, uh, we're still seeing a lot of consoles getting scalped and being sent overseas to China. Um, now we're not sure exactly how much that's affecting the overall supply of PS5s and uh, for Japanese customers and how often they're able to comfortably buy and play on the system. Uh, but given three, four million on paper and selling 336,000 units in week one, that is Quite, that's quite a good attach rate. Uh, and more so, we can already see the game is the best sold, the, the highest sold PS5 game uh, overall. <laughs> it was that easy uh, because we, as we've said time and time again, Japan is just no longer a console centric market. It's primarily Switch nowadays because it can be portable. And really Switch is even a, a smaller size compared to mobile in that space, right? In that, in that territory. So that's just where we are. But given the, the context and the situation, it seems like even in Japan, the game is doing reasonably well. Moving on to our next story, the recently acquired developer Fire Sprite is getting the full PlayStation Studios treatment by growing and expanding. So recently they announced they're moving into a new office space in the Liverpool city center and the building looks uh, really gorgeous, uh, really big, wide, spacious, a lot of room for recreation as well. Um, the company is still doubling down and having a low energy footprint and they're also still accommodating work from home. So it's not like they got this big expensive lease uh, in the city center and saying, hey, you have to show up five days a week in the office. So um, they're still working with those that want to work from home. That's great, uh, but also they're still expanding. So now they're over 250 employees, and um, you know we saw them ship Horizon Call of the Mountain at the start of this year with uh, that was in collab uh, collaboration with Gorilla. But we know Fire Sprite is a multi-team studio; they have multiple projects going on. And so while Fire Sprite may not on paper be the most exciting studio or the most exciting acquisition in PlayStation history, we see the investment from this platform holder, and so I would really like to see what they're going to do in in 10 years time um and if fire sprite can really evolve into um this top tier studio that puts them in the same league as your sucker punch naughty dog santa monica you know there's certainly potential but uh maybe we're seeing the start of that right now 
Next up, we have a new trailer and new details for Helldivers 2, which is still coming out this year for PS5 and PC. I feel like some may have already forgotten about that, but it is still coming out this year, and that's why we just got new details over on the PS blog, where uh, they primarily talked about the Helldivers, what they call stratagems. These are specific tools that you can summon during combat, so they can be things like airstrikes or maybe supply drops containing better weapons and armor, things like that. Uh, the idea here is that for a four-person squad, you're going to want to fit into certain roles, so you're customizing your loadout and your stratagems appropriately and coordinating with your team, so someone might want to tank, the other one might want to hang back and snipe. Then you've got somebody that might fit into more of a defensive role, summoning shields throughout the entire thing. Um, and they also reiterate the always-on friendly fire because they want you to coordinate and talk with your teammates while you're seeking out objectives or doing these little side quests. So, you know, they didn't say too much, but we can get a better idea of the gameplay loop that, that they're going for here. And um, the gameplay looks good, and it's something where they do you know, reiterate coming out this year. So it's not like there's, there's any kind of imminent delay so far. So that's why we saw more, uh, gameplay recently because the, you know, the game is probably coming out in the next three, four months, which, um, doesn't feel like it, right? But uh, yeah, we're getting close enough as is. So it uh, looks good so far. I am a little bit concerned that maybe this game is going to get lost in the mix, especially when, while I think the gameplay does look engaging, it very much has a, I don't want to say it, it, it has a lack of identity, but if you do compare it to a lot of other standard third-person shooters, and God forbid they have some sci-fi elements, it might get a little bit lost in the mix, but uh, we'll reserve judgment until the game comes out. But I, I think there's some concern there, but I do think it looks uh, like a lot of fun, especially if there is something there where it's a bit more conducive to playing by yourself if you want to, uh, though clearly that's not necessarily the elevator pitch they're going for right now. Now this is more of a brief PSA in case anything does happen, but uh, Insomniac Games will be at the 2023 San Diego Comic-Con with a panel called Symbiotic Relationships on July 20th featuring actors and developers from the game. So we should see something there what we don't really know could be minor story details could be some cool little anecdotes about the game's development or it could be a trailer that's not totally unheard of either but you know considering the game is coming out in october uh, we're getting closer and closer i mean i would say there's a good chance we might see a trailer or a teaser or something like that but uh, at the very least uh we don't have we don't have too much longer of a wait until the next uh minor or major spider-man 2 news update now, one thing we've seen a lot of during the PS5 cycle is Sony investing in third-party studios or trying to secure exclusivity in some way, like for example with the uh, South Korea studio Shift Up for Stellar Blade, which is now a PS5 exclusive, which we're not sure if that game is still coming out this year. I'm starting to think maybe not. Uh, but that's one example. And so it seems like Sony might be looking to invest more in Korea where uh, a recent report came out from mtm.co.kr where they say Sony is discussing partnership plans with various Korean studios, which could be minority investments or securing exclusive content in some way. So some of the studios that they named off include Pearl Abyss. They're currently working on the action RPG Crimson Desert. There's Com2 US. That's a mobile studio, the developer of Summoner's War. There's NeoWiz Games, they're a game publisher, they're publishing Lies of P. Then there's NCSoft, the MMO studio, the one rumored to be handling a Horizon project. So nothing about this is all too surprising to me. I believe we had some SIE job openings in South Korea, if I'm not mistaken. But um, this is something where I think all the platform holders are acutely aware of the investment opportunity in all these untapped markets where you've got these studios that need funding and it's a lot of very much untapped talent, right? Uh, places like South Korea, India, South America. And so I think they're just looking everywhere to try and work out something, right? And so uh, for South Korea, which is up and coming with all these big studios um, putting out these really ambitious projects, uh, I think it would be... Uh, in Sony's best interest to try and work something out. And we might see in the next two, three years, more of these announcements being made of, you know, they made a mi minority investment here. They secured another exclusive contract for uh, so-and-so game. And so I think we'll see a lot of that in the next few years. But um, if I had to guess, I'd say that's almost a guarantee. Moving on to our big rumor from this past week about The Last of Us Part 3. 
This is coming from uh, Daniel Rickman or Daniel RPK, primarily covering movies, uh, TV, comics, books, things like that, right? So I don't really uh, follow Daniel too closely, uh, but it's my understanding that if they post something on their Patreon, then it's usually a scoop that they feel very confident about in terms of its accuracy. And if it's not on there, then it can be hit or miss in terms of if it's reliable or not. Um, and we know with rumors, you know, they, they typically spread and based on what was said, it can be taken as gospel and this and that. So that's why they might be seen as unreliable. But the point is, Daniel doesn't primarily cover games. Uh, but they recently posted on Patreon details about The Last of Us Part 3. So they say that part of the plot is about a group of scavengers surviving on the outskirts of a city in a Victorian-style house that serves as their base. Naughty Dog is looking to cast a few roles, which is uh, there's, there's Val, she's the leader of the group, then there's Ezra, someone who wants to take the house from Val, so some kind of antagonist. Then there's Lucas, uh, someone who develops a relationship with another young scavenger. Mason, a former soldier who must decide on their loyalty between Ezra and the house under Val's leadership. And then Gracie, no major details on this character, but they're aged, uh, they're aged between 18 and 25. Now, that's most of what we heard from Daniel, but there's also this other Twitter account, at Viewer Anon, that's been primarily covering movies as well. And they mentioned a while ago that Part 3 is indeed in development at Naughty Dog. And so they recently provided a comment on this rumor saying that story details can be tweaked, things change. But from what they've heard, Ellie is still as important in Part 3 as she was in Part 2. And they also mentioned motion capture is happening this year. So... That's all we know so far. Uh, all rumors, obviously. I mean, that's the thing that we can, uh, I guess, dive into right away. It's always been a big question mark on Naughty Dog's next big single-player epic. Is it part three or is it a new IP, right? Because the other thing we can say safely about Naughty Dog is that they've got multiple game directors all at the studio right now, and it's... <laughs> You know, it's something where we know they have a lot of directors and some can share that role with another director, but um, they've got all these people that are not uh, assigned to a particular project as in they're not revealing what their project is, right? So um, I guess it's more a matter of like which one is going to be out the door first, which one is getting most of the attention and is in full swing production. So is that part three or is it the new IP? Is it factions, which we recently caught wind of what may or may not have happened with that game. Uh, the reason why we haven't seen it just yet is that apparently Bungie looked at it and it was either downsized or Bungie brought into question the long-term viability of keeping players engaged. So, you know, whether the project is downsized or not, or when we're ever going to see that game, I am seeing some theorize that the casting, uh, the casting rumor from Daniel is actually about factions, which is plausible because I think, again, the, the ongoing theory about what a uh, full-scale Last of Us multiplayer was going to look like is, you know, a Division or Outrider style game where you can play it by yourself and there is this growing narrative with, you know, characters that come and go like GTA Online and things like that, right? So it could be that, um, but considering Ellie does, Ellie is certainly going to play a role, right? And so, um, that's what we're hearing from viewer Anon. But without diving into too much uh, too much speculation, because that really doesn't get us anywhere, um, the safe thing to say is that it seems like we're hearing more and more about Part 3 and not about a new IP. So while Naughty Dog may certainly have a new IP, um, you know, that's in the very early stages, it may not be far along enough compared to the last of us part three which could be in full production as 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 is being suggested um and the ip is has never been stronger obviously right with the hbo show um sure neil is still looking to close out that chapter on the on the story and those characters and because that's the, the, uh, the last of us universe means a lot to him i'd be very surprised if he does not want to see at least part three close out the trilogy and then you know usually with long-term projects like that where he spent, you know, 20, uh, not 20, 10 plus years of his life on that one property. Um, they either like to move on to something else or take a sabbatical or this and that. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to speak on Neil's life here, but you know what I mean? Like I could feel, I feel like that could be one of the last things Neil does um, before he moves on to something else or takes on a new chapter in the Naughty Dog life or outside of Naughty Dog, right? So, um, yeah, I think we'll just, we'll leave it there for now, but we are hearing more about part three than a new IP. So 
Perhaps that is the direction Naughty Dog is going for their next major single player game. Next up we have what appears to be some leaked screenshots and details for the SIE published and Team Ninja developed PS5 exclusive Rise of the Ronin coming sometime next year, although maybe it's coming sooner rather than later based on this info where it's coming from the Snitch Discord. Now if you remember the Snitch on Twitter, that was the Twitter account that was extremely accurate because they seemingly had access to uh, what we assume is unlisted YouTube videos. Then they retired because I guess they lost access to how they had that info, but um, it's coming from their Discord, not them themselves. They are crediting this to another user in the Discord uh, named Soldier Delta, but here's what we apparently learned about this game. So it's a mix of Assassin's Creed, Ghost of Tsushima, and Dark Souls, with many item descriptions being used as, uh, well, they're there to expand the lore and make it bigger and better. So you might find a, a sword as an example, and it tells you where it was made, um, who made it, and things like that. Um, which could lead to numerous side quests that are apparently more Ubisoft side quest designs. There's difficulty options, there's skill and technique trees, there's a performance and quality mode. Apparently they're trying to improve the fidelity mode before launch uh, or improve fidelity in general. And then there's also planned romance options. Uh, but more importantly, we're also hearing that the game is planned for Q1 2024, which I think it's fair to say most were not expecting it that soon. So maybe that's why this leak even happened and maybe we'll see more within the next month or two. I mean, it could be a trailer, state of play, whatever. But if they're planning on launching at Q1, you know, that feels very soon for a game we don't know a whole lot about. So, um, well, if these uh, leaks are true, then we can at least judge it on what we're hearing so far, which um, nothing in here too alarming. I mean, it sounds uh, good to me, or I, I guess that depends on <laughs> your perception, right? I mean, it's it's funny because there's already this sort of uh, negative connotation that's brewed over the years with Ubisoft games. So whether it's their side quest designs uh, their open world concepts or, you know, hearing it's a mix of all these good games and then, oh, Assassin's Creed, like, that's a negative. Um, I don't know. I mean, it really depends. I mean, for me, I haven't played a whole lot of Ubisoft games in recent years, so I can see how some, if they're playing them every year and they can feel very monotonous and samey, then, you know, it's kind of like, ugh, you know, more of a drag. That's a sentiment I've been seeing for, you know, it feels like a long time now. But having said that, most games, most developers, dare I say all of them, they're always borrowing and cherry picking ideas from things they've played in recent years or successful franchises that came out, right? So, you know, every game that you play is inspired by things that came before it. So it doesn't mean it's going to be heavily Assassin's Creed-esque, just that it might be borrowing ideas from Tsushima, Dark Souls, and Assassin's Creed, some of the best ideas that they're trying to, you know, birth into its own identity, which would be Rise of the Ronin. So uh, it sounds interesting in theory, but let's uh, wait patiently for the official info, which might not be too far behind. Now, the other big news story from this past week is from the Microsoft versus FTC preliminary injunction hearing, where there was a court filing on paper that shows Microsoft is making some arguments about uh, comparable consoles and price points. And this is where they're clearly referencing the rumors from uh, Insider Gaming, where they talk about a apparent PS5 Slim at a reduced price point, which depending on where you have read about this or heard about it, uh, certain headlines may have been a bit misleading, almost suggesting that it's a lower price point than what we have right now. But basically what the document says, uh, and I quote here, PlayStation likewise sells a less expensive digital edition for $399.99 and is expected to release a PlayStation 5 Slim later this year at the same reduced price point. Further down, they even reference the rumored PS5 Pro and again, the Slim console. Now, what's happening here is that uh, the Microsoft lawyer or whoever wrote this, they are very much referencing Tom's work. Uh, but they are just overlooking the one area where Tom did confirm that. And I say confirm as in like, this is based on what Tom's heard. Uh, he's got a very good, reliable track record, a rock solid source that's high up the food uh, food chain at Sony. Uh, but from what he's saying, the console that is coming out on year three, the expected slim console, where I myself thought, you know, Sony's done this for generations. So we should be seeing it this year. This upcoming detachable disk drive console is going to look principally like the current PS5 right now. 
which would still be conducive to using the same console covers, but um, we are not expecting a slim console this year, despite the Microsoft lawyer and what's in this FTC document. And also it would still be the same price point basically. This is more about Sony. Um, streamlining production to make one machine and then having this de uh, this detachable disk drive they can sell separately and i think they're still probably going to do an 80 20 split where most of the ps5s they're selling already has the disk drive so it really is something where for them it's about streamlining manufacturing and uh that's where that's where we should be seeing this thing sometime this September and Sony won't officially confirm it until the very last minute or as close as they possibly can. I am still seeing some ask, you know, is this thing even real? Are they really doing this? Because we still haven't heard anything, but you know, whether it's a, a major slim redesign or a, a, a smaller model revision, uh, this is, <laughs> this is the catch 22 because Sony does do things much differently, but Usually they'll try and wait as close to the launch as they possibly can and then say, hey, it's coming out next week or this and that. You don't want to cannibalize sales of the current machine, which is a good segue to our next story, which is in some European countries and I think also South America and uh, I think Brazil. They're discounting the disc console by a pretty good amount. They're more or less offering it at the same price as the digital console. So they are trying to uh, liquidate the current disc consoles where there's maybe more stock allocation that's not moving fast enough to to not moving fast enough by the time they want to eventually ship this new detachable disk drive console. Now granted, there's nothing really different here. You're not gonna be missing out on too much other than having the option to remove or add a disk drive, but um, it seems like there is a deal to be had based on where you are. So uh, if there is a discount for PS5 right now, you could be getting it at a much cheaper price, which um, not, a, not exactly a bad get. Um, so. If this thing is coming out in September, all lines up. Uh, maybe we'll see them finally confirm it on the PS blog and with a new YouTube video in a month or so. Again, they'll, they'll try and get very close to when it's finally launching and that's where they might even just, you know, we might see leaks before they officially talk about it as we've often seen with their uh, model redesigns. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are some of the stories from this past week. And our Tuesday video was nothing because I was working on other Tuesday videos. So hopefully the next one will be ready on time. But until then, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bonecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.